All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Hopefully, you know, you got your donut or coffee, but sorry, no caramel rolls today. <laughs> we'll save it for next time. Uh, we'll uh, continue with the, some of the other talks. The, our next speaker is Dr. Chenyan Chu from USDARS in Fargo, and he will be presenting identification and integration of beneficial genes to improve biotic stress resistance and sugar beet yield in sugar beet. Thank you, Dr. Chu. The floor is yours. Okay, today I uh, thank you and uh, for this opportunity for talking about my research. And uh, I'm Chingin Chu and uh, should be uh, research genetics in USDA IRS was based in Fargo, North Dakota. And so today this uh, title was pretty broad and uh, of course this is a uh, uh, corporate research. That's why I list all the scientists here and want to get the collaboration with all people, but it's not limited to this, I want to, uh, set up more collaboration with uh, uh, our papers joining today or even not joining today and uh, we can set up more connection. And, okay. So, because I'm new to this community and uh, I just give a little bit more background information about myself. And I received a PhD degree from uh, North Dakota State University in plant science. And during that time, I mostly do this uh, mapping population development and for QTR identification, mostly for the fungus disease in wheat. And later on, I did two years postdoc in NDSU and uh, focused on wheat FHB, that's the number one disease in wheat, and also identify QTR and also for the other foliar disease like 10 spot. And then we use this uh, markers linked to different resistant genes to develop the new germplasm. And meanwhile, did some sequence analysis for the new uh, organization gene, that's VRMV1. And later on, I worked in the private company, mostly just use this uh, with the double haploid technology to accelerate wheat breeding. In 2017, I moved to Texas A&M AgriLife uh, Agri Research Center based in Amarillo, Texas. And there I did this uh, with genetic genomic research, mostly focused on the association mapping and the genomic prediction for wheat green yield and did RNA-seq analysis for identifying the drought tolerance genes in wheat. So currently in the research genetics in sugar beet and my research, mostly I want to conduct uh, uh, this following research. First, I want to uh, collaborate with entomologists for uh, improving the sugar beet resistance to the insect root maggot. And also I want to collaborate with the pathologists for uh, improving the sugar beet resistance to a sarcosporative spot and also some other root rot diseases. And also want to collaborate with the virologists who are working on the uh, improving the resistance to rhizomania caused by this virus. And also want to collaborate with uh, uh, agronomists, uh, physiologists, molecular biologists for working on improving the sugar yield, sugar bit quality, and then the post-harvest storage, and also the photosynthesis rate. And finally, I want to explore more the technique uh, for producing the sugar bit double haploid. And because this uh, double haploid was 100% homozygosity, so that's the idea material for uh, conducting research about the hydrosis. So for conducting all this kind of research, uh, my uh, thought was, of course, we start from collecting the germplasm. And then after we get this germplasm, we can, uh, of course, we need to increase the number of the seeds for uh, field, for the treaty validation in the field or uh, in control the conditions. And also we need to do the genotype to know what's the uh, genetic information of all those germplasms. Once we get this uh, genetic, uh, genotypic data and the trait data, we can combine these. We can start from 
association mapping and to identify the uh, genomic regions associated with some uh, trait of the interest and to identify these genes. And then we can select some uh, specific the gene presence to form those biparental, biparental populations and to for gene identification and to conduct the genetic genomic research. And also we can use markers linked to the specific beneficial genes to do marker assisted interrogation. So in this way, we can uh, develop the new gene presence with the interest trait and also uh, we can even isolate the genes and to understand what's the genetic mechanism for control of this trait. And so here this just shows this year, this past year, I uh, connected uh, uh, over nine, 100, uh, 1,900 uh, germ plasms, most from the uh, cut with the sugar bit and also some other bit. And uh, particularly this wide bit, uh, Maritima, we have almost 600 lines there. And now I'm start to uh, germinate all the seeds and to increase the seed, increase it in this year. And, uh, and also do this uh, genotype by sequencing to genotype all the lines to identify the SNPs to cover the whole genome. And then we will do this genetic diversity analysis and to identify a core collection that can cover all the uh, genotypic variation in, all, in the connection, but we can minimize the number of lines we can put in for the treat evaluation. And so in this way, we can reduce some of the work in the field and all the efforts for the treat evaluation. So uh, this could be like in next year, uh, NATOM, we mostly focus on this part. So here just shows some few pictures like this we I you yeah a few seconds to wrap up please okay okay so this just shows some like uh, uh, this year I did some uh, field work for Casper deep spot and uh, and this uh, insect resistance for the uh, for for uh, an insect in the uh, St Thomas nursery. And finally, I just show you this is my contact information. And if you uh, have any anything want to connect me, just shoot me the email or call me. And thank you all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. In the best interest of time, please uh, post your questions in the Q and A. We'll move on to our uh, next presentation. It's uh, Dr. Wanita Ramachandran from USDA ARS in Fargo. She'll be talking about CRISPR-based next-generation diagnostic method development for detecting viruses in sugar beet. So, uh, um, hello. So, uh, I am Vanita Ramachandran, and uh, I am a sugar beet virologist with the sugar beet and potato research unit, um, uh, uh, part of the USDA ARS, uh, located here uh, in Fargo, uh, North Dakota. And uh, I joined uh, for this position uh, September uh, onwards. So it's about four months and few days. And it's, so far it's been exciting. And um, thank you for the opportunity to get introduced myself uh, to the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board audience. Uh, today I will be discussing about uh, a little bit on the CRISPR-based next generation diagnostic uh, method development for detecting viruses in sugar beet. So uh, why uh, method development is uh, interested uh, is because the diagnostic is uh, a key for uh, disease management. So uh, viruses keep uh, evolving and it's uh, important to get to know the sequence identity of the virus. So, and the next step would be to develop an assay uh, which helps to identify the virus, uh, the causative uh, for any disease uh, related to that in the field and then move forward with strategies to manage the disease. So with the sugar beet um, diagnostics, uh, we are looking for an ideal assay that is uh, specific uh, uh, for, uh, which, which has high specificity and easy to do, and uh, just the rapid 
rapid and um, cost effective and the most importantly uh, field deployable meaning that you can just uh, take it a strip or something and try to detect the, the virus in the field so there are a lot of uh, molecular technologies those are available and uh, elisa is one of those uh, which is routinely used for uh, uh, rhizomelia field uh, sample evaluations uh, and that is a protein based and, um, uh, and it has some limitations with the specificity and uh, it's not portable. And uh, the other technology is the qPCR, which is uh, highly sensitive uh -huh. and uh, um, which is sequence specific, but it's still not portable. And the recently developed CRISPR based assay is sequence specific and it's been shown that cost effective and then it can be wrapped rapid and uh, it is field deployable. So that is why, why we are interested in de developing such a uh, CRISPR-based virus diagnostics assay for sugar beet virus detection. So this slide shows an overview of how the assay works and uh, this assay is um, developed for human virus diagnostics and basically the CRISPR technology is meant for genome editing. However, because uh, recently a second um, activity was uh, discovered with the Cas protein, some of the Cas proteins, and that set up the base for the CRISPR-based assay for human virus uh, diagnostics. And uh, basically it's sequence specific because the CRISPR RNA, which is uh, mentioned here is a gRNA, is a guide RNA that determines the specificity of the target sequence with which the assay is going to be triggered and detected uh, uh, later on the reporter signal. So we are envisioning the sugar beet virus detection using this technology and the four most important uh, aspect to go into uh, this technology is the isothermal amplification of the uh, viruses. So it's been discovered in human virus um, diagnostics and um, the technology is quickly skyrocketed because of a lot of funding and effort put forward for the uh, human virus and detection projects. So here to, to demonstrate the isothermal um, amplification of sugar beet virus, what I have shown here is the amplification of a beet necrotic yellow vein virus um, that you can see a band here on the two left side of the panel in two um, gel pictures. So when I loaded just five microliters and 10 microliters, you can see a very nice specific band and the next thing is that okay you are seeing in the infected sample but not in the healthy samples is it a legitimate uh, um, uh, amplified product representing the B and YBV so I took that uh, band the gel purified and sent it out for Sanger sequencing and what you see on the right side is the is confirms the sequence identity of the um, isothermal amplified B and YBV, B and YBV fragment indicating that we have developed the isothermal amplification of uh, uh, BNYVV, and that uh, happens to be uh, the, the right, containing the right sequence. So the rest of the assay uh, for developing this uh, CRISPR uh, diagnostic approach for sugar beet virus detection is in progress. And uh, this slide shows uh, my first uh, sugar beet uh, field trip, uh, which is kindly coordinated by John Weiland and uh, kindly um, done by um, Joe Hastings from the American Crystal Sugar Company. I was really excited and this was my ever first uh, field trip. Thank you, Joe Hastings. And uh, I was so excited to see the different uh, processes that's being involved, although it was at the uh, end of uh, or middle of uh, October, end of the season. Um, so I was um, uh, um, uh, happy to seeing the, how the sugar beet uh, field uh, is uh, uh, processed to get the beet out of the field and how it's processed and piled for uh, sugar uh, um, uh, extraction in the industries. So this will be my first uh, field trip and I hope that many more yet to come uh, across the nation uh, in the coming years. So with that, I would like to thank uh, the, everyone in the sugar beet and potato research unit here in Fargo. So I thank Melvin uh, for his uh, support and feedback and uh, providing resources uh, for carrying out uh, the virology uh, work. 
and John Wyland has already established um, sugar beet related virus work and he has been very instrumental in introducing me to collaborators and to the field samples and to many, many, many more uh, things. And Jonathan Newbauer is a lab manager and he is um, very kind in introducing me to several uh, instruments in the lab and Elisa to also uh, several materials that I needed here and there to like a buffer or something. So she is very kind and uh, Alex Desert for plant care, um, uh, watering and uh, Dr. Karen Foke introducing me to uh, different uh, and uh, required um, USDA related administrative uh, startups and Cheng and Ju, uh, so he's my neighbor and uh, we chat every day for small, small help I take from him and uh, Linda Bacon for office support and all members of the Bolton Lab. And I would like to thank Joe Hastings again for the field trip and uh, we have got the soil and beet sample from Mark Bloom Quest from Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative and we have conducted some research uh, sapping the, uh, transferring the um, viral diseases from the beet to sugar beet. And that, that is giving a lot of interesting and exciting data which are yet to come. And uh, uh, we are thankful to the seed companies for providing us seeds to carry out our virology related research work here at the center. And here is my contact information and uh, my um, anytime, please feel free to shoot me an email or uh, here is my cell number in case if there is any question re related to uh, the virus diseases in sugar beet and I'll be happy to um, collaborate on any aspect with that. So thank you so much and I can take any questions. If so our next speaker uh, is Dr. Karen Figate from ESDA ARS in Fargo and she'll be talking about Effect of Circospora leaf spot on sugar beetroot storage properties. Looks really good, Karen. Thank you. You can go okay. ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ashok. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak here today. Um, okay, uh, Circospora real is a disease that really needs no introduction. Um, the, the effect of, of the disease on uh, uh, sucrose content and yield at harvest are well known. What we don't know, however, is the effect of disease on, um, on storage properties. And so we're, what we're interested in is how Circospora leaf spot affects storage properties of roots. And what we're interested in are properties like respiration rate, sucrose loss in storage, and how root purity might change it during storage. And the reason for this is, is actually pretty straightforward. Um, we need to know how Circospora leaf, leaf spot affects storage properties if we want to be able to predict storage losses, if we want to uh, find out if there are certain levels of disease that would preclude the roots from being included into storage piles, or determining if there is um, maybe a benefit to segregating beets with Circospora leaf spot for early processing. Uh, we started out doing an experiment, or we, and we still are, uh, working with Muhammad Khan and his, his people. And Muhammad is doing the field studies, and we're doing the, the storage study. But basically, the experiment is fairly straightforward. Field plots were established in a field outside of Foxholm, Minnesota. The plants were inoculated with uh, Circospora baticula infected leaves in mid-July. And then the field plots were treated with different fungicide uh, compounds or tr fu different fungicides and different fungicide regimes to obtain plants with a varying range of disease symptoms. Just prior to harvest, the plants were rated on a one to 10 scale where a one would be a completely healthy plant 10 would be a plant that was completely defoliated and the roots were then harvested. Muhammad then gave us the, the roots that he harvested from these plots and we took roots that had four levels of disease severity. We took the healthiest roots, the most uh, diseased roots and two intermediate levels. So we had four levels of disease severity based on the CLS ratings. The roots were stored for 120 days at five degrees C and we looked at storage properties at harvest and after 30, 90 and 120 days in storage. The experiment was started in 2018 and it's been conducted also in 2019 and 2020. We're currently in the third storage study. 
Um, what I'm going to be presenting today is the results from 2018 and 2019 because th those experiments have been have been uh, completed. Um, but what we've seen so far in the third year is is consistent with the results that I, that I'll be presenting today. So the first thing we look at when we look at storage traits is typically looking at respiration. Uh, sugar beets respire, they're, they're living organs and they respire until they are killed either by freezing or by processing. Respiration is important for the root because it provides the metabolic energy to support the, its, its processes, but it's, it's detrimental for the in industry because it uses sucrose and is the principal cause of sucrose loss in storage. Respiration is also a problem because it generates heat, which contributes to the warming of storage piles. So what you see here is the data that we collected in the first two years of the study. We got year one and year two. We had roots with four different uh, uh, degrees of Cercospora leaf spot. Uh, both years were very similar, and they ranged from a, a CLS rating of three up to almost 10. Um, so We've got the four ratings. Uh, we, we collect the data at 30, 90, and 120 days. I'm only showing the 30 and 120 20 days of storage or days after harvest, just in the interest of time. But know that the 90 degree day is consistent with this data. And rather than actually look at the number, actually, which, which we really should do is look at the letters. Um, where the letter, if the letter's the same, then the data is statistically significant with, with other items or other, other, um, other values that have that same letter. And the data is really clear and very easy to see. If you look at uh, 30 days or 120 days, we see all A's going down. Uh, same with year two. You see all the, the data, all the respiration rates are statistically the same. And so a uh, fairly straightforward conclusion that Cercospora leaf spot at any severity level had no effect on storage respiration rate. The second trait we looked at was sucrose content. So this is the percent sucrose content of the sugar beet root. Again, we're looking at the same two years and the same CLS ratings on these four groups of beets. And what you can see here is um, the first two, the, the roots with the lower levels of Cercospora have similar levels of sucrose content, while those with the what, what I consider moderate to severe, those with uh, CLS ratings of 6 to 10, um, you see a different letter, meaning that they're statistically different. So we're seeing for the moderate to severely, the beets that have moderate and severe CLS, you see a, a decline in sucrose content. We see it at 30 days, 120 days. We see it in both years. So, the so what we're looking at is you're seeing lower sucrose content. But the thing that we need to remember is that these beets started out with less sucrose at harvest. If you look at the harvest data, you see that same trend. Uh, the moderate and severely uh, infected roots have, or infected plants have um, lower sucrose content at harvest. So the question is then is, is Cercospora affecting sucrose content in harvest or um, affecting sucrose content during storage, or is it just a reflection of this difference in sucrose content that occurred at harvest? And to look at this, this is a little bit confusing, but it's what we did uh, on this, for this graph or for this table is if you look at how much sucrose is lost due to the increasing severity of Cercospora. Um, so for example, you know, if you're looking at this harvest data, uh, these roots with a CLS rating of 3.3 has have 0.3% less sucrose, while those with a CLS rating of 9.8 have 2.2% less sucrose relative to our, our most healthy roots in the study. And what you can see is as you look across the data, whether it's year one or year two, you can see that the loss that you had due to increasing severity of Cercospora doesn't get bigger with time. So what that, that suggests to us is that um, we're not seeing an acceleration in the rate of sucrose loss during storage. We see less sucrose in these beets during storage because there was less sucrose in them at harvest. 
Sucrose loss to molasses is another trait that we typically look at. It's, a, it's an indicator of the amount of sugar that is not recoverable during processing, and it's, it's not recoverable due to the concentrations of three impurities, sodium, potassium, and amino nitrogen compounds. And these three compounds tend to pull sucrose into molasses, making it um, unrecoverable by crystallization. Um, if we look at the first year, the this, this data is just very simple to look at. There aren't any statistically significant changes that occur at 30 days or 120 days in the sucrose loss to molasses. Uh, year two, uh, we saw a difference just in one data point. Uh, this was at 30 days after harvest, and these were the beets that had the most severe CLS rating. They did have a statist statistically greater increase in um, the amount of sucrose lost to molasses. But again, when we do that same sort of calculation where we look at, um, is this the difference in purity at harvest or is it an, an increase in impurities during storage? We see that the differences are, are the differences that existed in, at harvest. And there seems to be no acceleration in the accumulation of non-sugars during storage. Invert sugars is another impurity. It, it, it doesn't enter into the SLM calculation, but it's an important impurity because invert sugars degrade to colored compounds, which makes it more difficult to, to produce white sugar. They increase sucrose loss to molasses. Uh, they break down to acidic compounds, which increase the use of lime, and they can make beets un unprocessable if present in sufficient quantities. Uh, this one, we see kind of the same trend that we've seen with the other traits. In year one, we do see an increase in invert sugars at 30 days. We don't see that at 120 days, and we don't see it at all in year, year two, whether at 30 days or 120 days. Um, so only at this 30 days at harvest, well, we saw this increase in invert sugars in the beets that had more severe CLS symptoms. But again, that wasn't repeatable in, in year two. The last trait that we looked at was recoverable sugar per ton. It's the yield of sugar after processing. And it takes into account not only the sugar content of the roots, but also the expected loss of sucrose to molasses during processing. Um, what we see here is very similar to what we saw with the sucrose content, where the beets with the two highest ratings of Cercospora have lower recoverable sugar per ton. And we see it in both years of the study, and we see it at both 30 days and 120 days after harvest. Um, but again, the question comes up, um, is it because of the differences at harvest? Because if we look here, we see that these beets in both year one and year two have less recoverable sugar at the time that they were harvested. And again, doing that same sort of calculation, you, you can look at the numbers and you can see that for the most part, um, you don't see an increase in the amount of recoverable sugar per ton that is lost as you go um, from the less diseased roots to the, to the more diseased roots. So again, the, the conclusion is what we've seen for the other traits is there seems to be no acceleration in the loss of recoverable sugar per ton during storage due to Cercospora leaf, leaf spot. So it makes the conclusions of this experiment very simple. Um, it, it seems that Cercospora leaf spot has no apparent impact on sugar beet root storage properties, regardless of the severity of the infection levels. Um, this is based on two years of, of research um, that we've completed, and we've got a third, third year going on, and that's the third year study seems to be entirely consistent with what we've seen here, uh, what's pr presented here. And so really what this comes down to is it suggests that there's, re there's no reason to take any special precautions with um, plants that have, or with the storage of roots that come from plants that have been infected with Cercospora baticula, and perhaps maybe not surprising since this is a foliar disease that seems to, uh, that shows no symptoms in the roots. And with that, I'd like to thank the r &E board for funding this research. All right. Hey, um, hey, Dr. Karen Fugate. I have a quick question. Uh, this is Austin Lean here. Um, 
I was just curious if there's ever been work to look at if Cercospora leaf spot may exacerbate the negative impacts that occurs um, from root rots in storage. So if you know the beets are also infected with root rots, if Cercospora can will negatively impact storage in that sense. Well, I think it's a really good question, and it's it's something that we don't have any data to make a suggestion one way or the other. Um, you know, I guess it, it's possible, but you know, it's with what we've seen with the Cercospora leaf spot, it just doesn't look like it's having any effect. Um, now, the root rots we know have serious effects on storage properties, um, but you know, as far as an interaction between the two, I. I I, I would hate to guess whether there is, you know, we just don't have any data to support any conclusions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Figured. I think we just need to move on to our next presentation here. So that will be Dr. Gary Secor from NDSU. He'll be talking about monitoring sensitivity of Cercospora reticola to foliar fungicides in sugar beet fields of Minnesota and North Dakota in 2021. Okay. okay yep. Thank you uh, for that introduction and happy to be here. I'm going to jump right into the slides and the results from this year because one, you've heard me talk about this for 20 years. You already know the background. And two, the previous speakers have already done a good job of introducing the subject. So. Uh, I do want to acknowledge Viviana and Melvin as uh, co-workers on this project. And we'll just start right out with Tin here. And I'm just going to go right through the results from uh, this year and the accumulated results. This is the incidence and severity of tin resistance collected from 90, 1998 to 2000. And you can see that you can see the chart. So we've been doing this for more than 20 years. The blue bars are the field incidence, uh, the number of fields with resistance, and the reddish brown line is the incidence of spore germination. In 2020, we tested 12, 1,201 samples, which is about average. We usually test about 1,200 samples. You can see that in 2020, uh, well, you can see that the high was in 2017, where we had 97% of the fields with tin resistance that dropped to 62 to 21 in 2019. 2020, the number of field with Cercospora with resistance to tin jumped up to 68%, which is just about the same as what we started at in 1998. So it does uh, there is some variability there. The spore germination uh, also increased from about 15% to about 40% in, in 2020. Uh, I think that this increase is because we've lost over the years from 2015 to 2020. We've had an increase in DMI resistance. We've lost QOI, so we've had more tin applications. And so we're increasing the resistance. Um, but don't forget that there is a fitness penalty in tin to, so the resistant isolates usually disappear from the population. Uh, this is the incidence of tin resistance by uh, factory district in 2020. Uh, and you can see that they go from uh, left to right in each factory district is 17, 18, 19, and 20. And you can see that the tin incidence increased in all of the factory districts compared to last year, except for our friends at Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative, the incidence of tin resistance actually reduced. All the other factory districts, the tin incidence increased. This is the distribution of Cercospa isolates uh, with EC50 to the DMI fungicides from 2019 and 2020. And again, the bars in each group is the 2019 and 2020 for each of the four fungicides at the bottom of the table. And if we go left to right, it's low values to high values from 0 0.01 to greater than 100 EC50 values. And you can see that 
with eminent, the incidence uh, greater than 100 was reduced in 2020 to inspire the incidents greater than 100 reduced again to uh, from 25 to four. In proline, the incidence greater than 100 was reduced. But in Provosol, uh, in the right hand side, the incidence was about the same in 2019 and 2020, okay, for the isolates greater than 100. Uh, so you can see that we've had some some changes in these values, and this may be to the to the the different four different fungicides, the DMI fungicides that were um, could have been alternated at at different combinations, which may affect the uh, performance of the fungicides. I also want to point out that. In addition to the EC50 values, we usually convert these to a resistance factor, which is, is the EC50 value divided by the baseline sensitivity. So it puts all of the fungicides on, on a comparable basis, so we can compare them directly. And you can see that beginning in 2016, we, had, we got so much resistance, we started testing at 10. And in 2019, we began testing at greater than 100 parts per million. So our, our, the resistance levels of the RF levels to the DMIs kept increasing. So we had to keep increasing our uh, con the test rates. So this is the resistance factor of isolates collected from 2017 to 2020 to Inspire, Proline, Eminent, and Provosol. And again, they go from left to right, 17, 18, 19, and 20. And you can see that inspire uh, the resistance factor increased in 2020, eminent increase in 2020, Provisol increased in 2020. They're at about the same level. So the resistance factor is about the same in those three fungicides. The one that is consistently lower is proline. And you can see from this data that proline is consist the resistance factor proline is continually lower, and there's some there's some um, unusual things about this molecule that probably make this this uh, this resistance factor so low. Uh, I'm going to show each of the four fungicides across factory districts, so you can see where you are in the factory district. This first slide shows the uh, EC50 values. Um, for the for eminent across factory district, and you can see that they're pretty even. The color that is the most prominent is this uh, flesh colored. So most of the isolates are between ten and a hundred parts per million. Okay, so that's eminent. If you look at Inspire, you can see that most of the isolates with resistance are between one and ten. So the Inspire level is, is a little lower. Again, the factory districts are about the same. Uh, this is Proline. You can see that there's a lot of isolates in the 10 to 100 parts per million, and a lot of isolates that are beginning to show up in red that are greater than 100 parts per million. Again, it's pretty similar across factory districts. Uh, this is Provisol across factory districts. You can see, despite the fact we've only had this product registered for two years, we already have a pretty high level of resistance greater than 100 parts per million. And then we have another group between one and 10 parts per million. So this is a little bit by modal, but again, it's pretty much the same across all factory districts. So it looks like there's consistent um, resistance to all four of the DMIs across all of the factory districts. This is sensitivity of isolates to headline from 2012 to 2020. And again, the news is, is not any better than it's been in the past years. You can see we started out with green in 2012 with no resistance. And by 2020, we've got a high level of resistance. Red is completely 100% resistance. Uh, flesh colored in yellow are more than 50% or equal to 50%. So very few isolates with resistance. So the trend is continuing that the resistance is not going away. Um, 
this is this is this is resistance to headline across factory districts and you can see that all of the factory districts have a lot of red for their resistance except mindac and mindac has 38 percent of the isolates that are more than 50 percent but look at how much less there is for absolute resistance in mindac and the green is even increasing a little bit in mindac now i don't know what they're doing and what church they're going to, but whatever they're doing, they need to continue because this is this is an encouraging and surprising aspect that we didn't anticipate. And if we look at factory districts in 2019 and 2020, you can see we started to see this trend in MINDAC in 2019, and it continues in 2020. So there, there may be something that we don't understand what's going on, but I think we need to investigate this. Uh, uh, and you guys at MINDAC, I'm gonna need your help to figure out what's going on here. So a little bit of a summary and conclusion, tin continues to be our best weapon that we only have in the US. The number of fields with tin resistance declined 36 and 65% the past two years, but increased 69% this year. The incidents, uh, went from 20% to 30% to 40% in 2020. So I think we're using it more. We need to do everything we can to preserve this fungicide. Topsin, we've got consistent resistance. We did not test for, for Topsin this year because the resistance is so consistent. It doesn't seem to go away at all. The triazoles, this is where most of the action is because we have, the four, have these four fungicides. The resistance factor is increasing for eminent Inspire and Provosol, but not from Proline since 2017. We hope that there's a fitness penalty of these isolates with high RF values. And as the high RF values continue to increase, I can't help but think we're gonna end up with some, some fitness penalties. Um, we are evaluating the PCR detection using particularly one mutation, the L144F that Dr. Bolton talked about that came from his lab. That was Becky's work for her PhD thesis. Uh, 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 we are in the process, or his lab is in the process of validating and evaluating whether we can use this in future years so we can get faster results for the DMIs. And of course, they should be applied with Macazeb or Copper Partner. Uh, copper inhibits spore germination at 10 parts per million. And I've had two questions about resistance to Macazeb. Resistance has never, ever been reported as ever. It should be never reported to Mancozeb since registration in 1948. So there's never been an incidence of resistance in Mancozeb or to Mancozeb in any crop by any fungus. So I think we're pretty safe with that. Um, QOI is a single mutation, has been present since 2016 does not appear to be a fitness penalty to allow the population to revert so far, but MINDUC results are really encouraging and surprising. Um, we're still not recommending QOI for CLS management, but for sure for frost protection. Um, I think we need to develop better CLS resistant sugar beet varieties. And we do have those now that were introduced this year that got some really high resistance. I think we need to look at the question, do these new varieties with high resistance uh, affect fungicide resistance? In other words, if they're highly resistant, does that get rid of those fungicide resistant isolates? We need to look at this in the future. Uh, I think we need to continue to look at cultural practice to reduce initial inoculum, help those fungicides work better, uh, getting rid of uh, deep plowing to, to bury the inoculum, burning the inoculum, those kinds of things, those cultural practices. And I think we can adjust the forecasting to include spore production and germination that Viviana talked about for early fungicide timing. Because it looks like from field work and our work that early fungicide application is going to be a very important aspect of, of managing Chicostro. Uh, and then I'd like to acknowledge the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board for uh, support for this work. Thanks for the companies that provided technical grade product for us and the technical assistance of Judith and Joe is greatly appreciated as well. So with that, I will end my presentation and Happy to answer questions, probably by. <laughs> I, I think we have time for a question, Gary. Thank oh, do you. We? Uh, alas, probably the 
the second one first because that looks maybe short answer for that or something similar. So why do you think the tin resistance is decreased in Southern Minnesota? But I saw the same trend for Crookston compared to everything else. Did you? That's that's interesting. I wonder if if those isolates, if the temperatures were colder or if the, you know, because they're at a fitness penalty with tin and, and maybe whatever conditions in those two areas where they did more plowing in the fall to bury the inoculum where the temperatures were colder. I, I don't know the answer, but it is interesting, but it does vacillate a little bit from time to time. You know, I, I don't know the answer for sure as Chuck. Thank you. So the other question from Christine from Ontario, Canada. Could you please explain some of the background on tin? It, if you have a quick answer, that would be good. <laughs> uh, Christine, you you don't use tin in Canada because I know you're up in Guelph there. But the background in tin is that it's been it's been here forever, and it's it's a broad spectrum uh, fungicide, and our growers use it fairly frequently, usually one or two applications per season. I don't know if that's the background you wanted. I could talk a lot longer. So if you want to call me or I can call you or we can email, I'm happy to do that as well. Thank Three you very much, Gary. Per season. Sorry? Three applications per season of the tin. How many? Three. They make use of it, the full tree in most places, maximum amount. Oh, wow. So that was up to three. See, that's that's an increase in the number of applications, too. Yeah. Thank you, right. Mohamed. Okay. Gary, you do have a question in the Q&A box, too, if you want to check that out. Thank you. I will, Mark. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, let's uh, move on to our next presenter. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Lou from uh, North Dakota State University. Fitness of Cercospora reticular resistant populations and their management with fungicides. Uh, so my name is Yang Shi Liu from North Dakota State University. Uh, today, my presentation is fitness of the cospora resistant population and the layer management with fungicides. And uh, first, I will uh, introduce my uh, outlines of today's presentation. So first, I will introduce the cospora leaf spot, which is a big problem to sugar bean industry. And then I will talk about the situation. So Cospora Pedicola developed the resistance to these two fungicides. And then I will present my research, the failure study of least resistant population and how to manage least resistant population using couple of fungicides. So, so Cospora leaf spot is a big problem as you see in this photo. Uh, the disease becomes so epidemic in this field. And the real problem is uh, the fungicides applied to this field are not working, uh, especially QOI uh, fungicides. Uh, why is that? The reason is uh, you can find from this table uh, talking about different fungicide uses for controlling so called spot in 2015. Uh, in the red circles, and you can see how many acres of fields apply with DMI and QI fungicides. And uh, that's the reason. Um, actually, uh, these two fungicides has been used, extensively used for more than 10 years. Uh, the next two slides is talking about how the Cercospora fungal population become more resistant over years. I think uh, Dr. Gary Seeker has made a good presentation to talking about how the resistant population become more resistant to DMI and QI fungicides. So I just skip these two slides. So since we have this resistant population, so how can we handle this situation? So we have conducted a fairness study to uh, try to understand uh, this resistant uh, population. Uh, we would like to know if resistant isolates, they are similar to sensitive isolates in some important fitness components, uh, such as aggressiveness to the sugar bits. Uh, so this is uh, the research objective to determine the fairness components of Socosra resistant isolates 
uh, compared to the sensitive isolates. Uh, in this study, uh, the resistant isolates include QOI resistant, DMI resistant, and both resistant isolates. And the sensitive isolates, they are sensitive to QOI and DMI fungicides. Uh, in this study, we evaluate four different fitness components, uh, which are mycelial growth, spore germination, and production, uh, and aggressiveness study in a greenhouse. Uh, this table is talking about the difference in different uh, fitness components across different uh, resistant group of isolates. Uh, if you see the first line, the sensitive isolates has the highest number in the radio growth and spore production compared to other resistant isolates. And in spore germination, they are almost the same. Uh, this is the uh, aggressiveness study in the greenhouse. Uh, we evaluate the disease development as we call AUDPC caused by different resistant isolates. Uh, you can see for, from the first line, the QI DMI sensitive isolates, they had highest AUDPC, which is similar to the both resistant isolates. Even we can see a significance in the AUDPC, but when you see the, but when you see the photos on the right, and however, all the isolates get very high disease severity at the end. So uh, from this information, so uh, this is a summary. Uh, although the resistant isolates uh, had a relatively slower disease development due to their fairness penalty on the radio growth and spore production, but the resistant isolates still cause high disease severity. So from uh, this uh, information, we know the resistant population, they are still aggressive. So as extension people, we would like to find some ways to manage this resistant population. So that's the reason today I would like to introduce my uh, next chapter, how to manage this resistant, how to manage this resistant population using couple of fungicides. Uh, this is a uh, field experiment photos from 2017. Uh, you can see how big difference if you use copper mixtures with other DMI fungicides. Uh, so this big comparison gives us an idea. Copper fungicides are working. So we have this research to evaluate the, the sensitivity of cercospora resistant isolates and we also, uh, to the couple of fungicides, and we also evaluate the couple of fungicides efficacy in the greenhouse and field studies. Uh, this is the product list for a couple of fungicides experiment. Uh, most of copper products, they are registered for use on sugar beet. Uh, we also include one product of sulfur, and we also include another product of copper fertilizer. Uh, this is the lab study testing the sensitivity of the isolates to the copper fungicides. And you can see uh, from the photos, uh, we uh, make different copper concentrations into the media. So we have copper media, then we place conidia onto the water agar and 16 hours afterwards, and we use microscope to see how they germinate. This is the table, this is the result. Uh, the table is talking about the mean AC50 value for each couple of products, inhibiting the, spore, inhibiting the spore germination by 50%. And from the photos, you can clearly see the spores can germinate very well, well in the control. Compared to the couple media, the spore germination has been limited. This is the, green, this is the greenhouse evaluating the efficacy of these products. Uh, we first, we use uh, this machine in the photo in the greenhouse to spray the couple fungicides on the leaves. 
drying the leaves for one for one day, and we do inoculation uh, with spore suspension, and then we place them into the humidity chamber uh, for disease development for a couple of days. Then we do disease evaluation. So this is the results from the photo. And you can see a lot of brown spots in the untreated check. And for the leaves treated with coppers, they are pretty good. And this is the results from analyzed data. And you can see there's a very high AUDPC in untreated check on the left. So obviously, the carpal form designs provide uh, effective control compared to the untreated check. It is also noted the mixture of coppers and sulfur are even more effective than using them alone. Uh, this is the field study. We also do the field study in 2019. Uh, this is the photos in the Fox Home, Minnesota. We do inoculation in July using resistant population as inoculum. Uh, we do disease evaluation during the growing season and we harvest them to the factory and we get sucrose data afterwards. Um, this is the photos from the field. And in the middle, you can see this is our treated track. You can see the brown leaves. So that field is not good. If you see on the left, which is the couple fungicide treatments, which is much better than the middle photo. Uh, the right photo is the mixture of copper and sulfur. Uh, from my personal well, I think mixture is a little bit better than a couple alone. Uh, this is the analyzed results. Uh, as you see, on treated check has highest disease ratings, nine, and the lowest sucrose. Uh, uh, obviously, any couple can do a better job than the check. Uh, similar to the greenhouse study, the field, uh, the field study, you can also see mixture is more effective than any product alone. Uh, this is a summary uh, in the lab study. Uh, we found a couple of family size. They are so effective to inhibit mycelial growth and spore germination. And in the greenhouse and field study, a couple of family size are very effective. And although we found some phytotoxicity in the greenhouse study, but we haven't seen any negative things in the, green, in the field study. Uh, we really recommend uh, growers can uh, do the mixtures, the copper mixtures with other fungicides because you will get a better disease control. Uh, so I will uh, summarize uh, a little bit today's presentation as take home message. Uh, number one, we have a Sarcospora population which is resistant to QOI and DMI fungicides and this population I guess is everywhere in the North Togoda and the Minnesota sugar beet growing area. Number two, uh, least resistant population, they are still aggressive and dangerous. Number three, the couple fungicides are very effective to provide disease control. Number four, we highly recommend it to do the couple mixtures with other fungicides especially uh, with site-specific fungicides, such as DMI. Uh, uh, when growers do the mixtures, you will get a better disease control. And at the same time, you are managing the fungicide resistant issues. Uh, that's all for today. Thank you. Uh, this is my acknowledgement. I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Muhammad Khan, and my funding resources, our team members, Peter Huck and Zia, and everybody in our department, Plant Pathology and DSU. Uh, 
I just make my long story short. So if you have any question about details of my experiment, you are so welcome. Uh, I just graduated. So if you have any job opportunity, uh, please inform me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Uh, Thank you. It's an excellent presentation. And I see one question here, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's meant for Gary or you, but it says that uh, applying Manip or Manzit products worked best for lead spot and other products did not work. So would it be better if you just spray Manip or Manzit fungicide every seven days and skip the other products? Uh, 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 man, Manzit, uh, this kind of uh, chemical product is also recommended. Uh, I haven't heard any resistant issues from that products. Uh, it will be effective to um, usually we do uh, usually we do the applications uh, every uh, 14 days but if you get a rainfall you will shorten the intervals uh, seven days or ten days that will be good uh, I as I answer that question well <clears throat> yes you can also follow up with the audience you know who posed the question too. Another okay. question is, how does copper compare to other protectant fungicides in terms of efficacy and longevity? Uh, uh, copper uh, copper uh, provide very effective uh, disease control. Uh, if you see the leaves in the greenhouse study, they are pretty good, pretty clean. Uh, in the field study, uh, they also perform very good as other uh, uh, like standard treatments. I also post a field study in 2017, and you can see how big difference there. If you add coppers into DMI fungicides, they are pretty good, pretty green. So I believe the coppers are very effective, especially you use them in the mixture. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, again, let's move on to our next speaker now. Austin Lin from uh, University of Minnesota, Department of Plant Pathology. So Austin is my first year PhD student. He's gonna talk about management of circospora leaf spot, why tank mixing is important. Perfect, thank you, for the thank you for the introduction, Dr. Chanda, and hello everyone. So uh, a little bit of redundancy here, but you know, as we've been hearing, sugar beet growers deal with many challenges, but circospora leaf spot, caused by Cercospora baticula has earned the reputation of being the most destructive foliar disease of sugar beet. And in Minnesota and North Dakota alone, the disease causes significant economic damage. And this results from the reduced harvest weights and the reduction of um, sugar percent and quality, which occurs from the destruction of the leaf tissue seen in this picture, as well as the effects of the pathotoxins produced by the fungus. So signs of the pathogen typically include these uh, black pseudostromata scattered within mature lesions. And these are actually the structures that can overwinter on infected leaf residue. And under ideal conditions of, of high humidity, canidia then develop from those stromata. And once those canidia detach and then land on another sugar beet leaf, they cause more infection. So this process of developing new canidia occurs several times and creates multiple infection cycles throughout the growing season. And in the field, those circular leaf spots are initially produced on the older leaves and the disease progressively moves to younger leaves. And with the progression of the disease, individual spots will coalesce into lesions and the heavily infected leaves will turn necrotic, remaining attached to the plant. So being that sugar beets are first defoliated during harvest and all of that leaf residue is left in the field, Management of the disease must incorporate the use of practices such as conventional tillage, crop rotation, and when possible, even spatial separation from previous sugar beet fields. <clears throat> and also when possible, the use of resistant varieties can really help limit disease, but each variety does have unique characteristics and most are still susceptible or only moderately resistant to Cercospora. And moreover, there is no substitute for the control achieved from fungicides and the fungicide's ability to interrupt the development of disease. And without effective fungicide-based management, significant economic losses can occur. 
So for managing Cercospor release spot in sugar beets, these are the protectant fungicides that are commonly used. These are the systemic fungicides that have been used. And as we've been discussing, fungicide resistance has been reported in many of these fungicide groups. And now Cercospor isolates are showing decreased sensitivity to DMI fungicides as well. And this is likely the result of the substantial reliance we have on DMIs. So one tactic uh, to maintain effectiveness of DMIs is by tank mixing or combining the DMI fungicide with the protectant fungicide in the tank for one spray application. And primarily copper and EBDC are used, uh, EBDC or mancozeb are used as tank mix partners, which are at low risk for developing resistance. And the use of these fungicide mixtures uh, comes from a recommendation by the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee to delay the resistance of evolution. But also, uh, so the rationale for this trial is that reports strongly suggest that tank mixing can provide more than additive effects in regards to disease control. However, anecdotal evidence, along with our own preliminary field trials, suggest that unanticipated and antagonistic effects can result from tank mixing certain chemistries and formulations. And also, lastly, reports and field trials have also suggested other protectant fungicides um, other than copper and EBDC that could be an effective tank mix partner. So this past summer, we conducted a field trial in which combinations of DMI fungicides and protectant fungicides were evaluated for their effect on harvestable root yield and sucrose quality, and of course, the relative control of Cercospor release spot disease on sugar beet. Essentially, the questions we want to answer are, do all these treatments provide equal control, or are any of these combinations synergistic or maybe even antagonistic? So the DMI fungicides treatments used in this trial were Proline, Minerva, also um, called Eminent. Um, we also used Provisol and Inspire XT. Provisol was first available at the sugar beet growers in 2019. And these are the protectant fungicides or the tank mix partners that we used in the trial. And as mentioned, EBDC and copper are frequently used, but sulfur was actually included as it's shown the potential to improve management of late leaf spot of peanut when added to DMI fungicides. Um, next, we have phosphites or phosphonates. Uh, these were reclassified actually as having activity in host plant defense induction and studies have shown it may have fungostatic properties. Also studies have shown bicarbonate or baking soda may have fungicidal properties. And also the Michigan Sugar Beet Research Council has been evaluating baking soda as a potential tank mix partner. And lastly, we have Bacillus subtilis, which is classified as a biological with multiple modes of action. So we established our field trial at the University of Minnesota's Northwest Research and Outreach Center in Crookston. The experimental design was a randomized split plot with four replicates, where the DMI treatments were assigned as main plots and the protectant fungicides were assigned as subplots. Uh, plants were thinned uh, to establish a uniform stand of 200 plants per 100 foot of row. And all plants were inoculated with this mixture of um, infected sugar beet leaves and fine tulk at a rate of three grams per row using this duster we created from a power drill and an algae bottle. Fungicide sensitivity results also indicated that the first leaf spots collected two weeks after inoculation were in fact susceptible to a DMIs. So fungicides were applied to the middle four rows and applications began when disease was first apparent. Uh, treatments were applied repeatedly about every 10 days for a total of five applications throughout the growing season. And to assess Cercospor leaf spot disease severity for each plot, I actually collected uh, leaves weekly from the middle two rows. Each leaf was then photographed and then analyzed with this Assess 2.0 computer software. Um, and then I was able to take the average percent severity to determine progress, uh, disease progress, and also the ordinal ratings of zero to 10. Um, the middle two rows of each plot were then harvested and weighed for root yield. <clears throat> and 12 representative roots from each plot were analyzed for quality at the American Crystal Lab in Moorhead. So this figure is comparing the recoverable sucrose per acre uh, for each main plot. Um, which are the DMI fungicide uh, treatments. So on the left is essentially all of the protectant fungicides in which no DMI was used. And then each DMI category is representative of all treatments um, 
treatment combinations that contained that particular DMI. The dotted line you see is the average across all treatments and the differing letters indicate significant differences. So essentially this figure is showing the significant impact that DMIs have in preventing yield loss compared to using only protectant fungicides. And although there is variation among Proline, Minerva, Inspire, and Provisol, it seems that statistically the achieved yield was equivalent. So this figure is also showing recoverable sucrose per acre, uh, comparing the protectant fungicide treatments. Um, and the treatments that included EBDC or uh, Man Mancozeb provided the greatest yield return compared to the other treatments, followed by copper and actually phosphite. Uh, so disease severity here is represented by that zero to 10 rating where zero is a healthy leaf and 10 equals severe disease. And a rating of six represented by this horizontal dashed line is equivalent to 3% severity, which is the threshold for proven economic damage. Um, so probably many of us are aware that weather conditions this year were extremely favorable for the development of Cercospora leaf spot. And leaf spots were first noticed at 54 days after planting, and then all treatments progressed similarly until 83 days after planting, where the no DMI main plot began to have significantly higher disease pressure. Additionally, there seems to be this trend where disease progressed similarly for the Minerva and Provisol treatments, and the Inspire and Proline treatments were similar. And after 91 days after planting, interactions among treatment combinations were becoming, were present. So this picture was taken at the end of August and it just shows the heavy disease pressure we had this season in the non-treated plots compared to treated plots. Uh, this picture or the set of pictures was taken the day before harvest and it shows the general outcome of tank mixing. So the left is the non-treated control the middle picture shows a plot that was treated with Minerva. And as you can see, the defoliation is not as severe, but there's still quite a bit of disease. And this is uh, how the EBDC or Man Mancozeb treatment plot looked as well. And finally, the plot that was treated with both Minerva and EBDC as a tank mix had much lower disease pressure. So this is the, disease, the, the final disease severity rating. Um, and now on the left, that no DMI main plot is broken down into all of the protectant fungicide treatments by themselves and the non-treated control. And then each DMI category contains all treatment combinations, including that particular DMI fungicide compared to the DMI by itself. So with few exceptions, the addition of a tank mix partner improved the relative control achieved at the end of the season. However, interesting interactions are present. Uh, so when protectant fungicide treatments were used by themselves, EBDC, copper, and sulfur resulted in significantly lower disease pressure compared to the non-treated control. But for the proline treatments, the addition of EBDC and phosphite resulted in significantly lower disease pressure compared to proline pro by itself. And the sulfur also added some benefit, whereas the sodium bicarbonate seems to be antagonistic. For the Minerva treatments, uh, it shows that EBDC and copper significantly provide added control, which has generally been the standard, but also phosphite and sulfur are providing a small improvement. Uh, the treatments with Inspire all seem to be statistically similar. However, adding EBDC or copper did not provide the greatest control. And interestingly, sulfur, phosphite, and the baking soda provided some added benefit. And for, the Provis <clears throat> and for the Provisol treatments, EBDC was the only tank mix partner that provided significant control uh, compared to Provisol by itself, but all treatments except for the biological did result in less disease as well. So this is the last little bit of data I wanted to show. So by taking that average percent severity and the number of leaf spots per leaf um, from the Assess computer software, I was also able to determine a relative size for the leaf spots. Uh, and that's represented by the size of the dot. And interestingly, even though the number of leaf spots for the EBDC treatments was generally much lower, the size of those leaf spots were generally larger, leading me to believe there may be some additional interactions that may be occurring that could hinder the performance of the DMI and that we're just not able to see. 
So results from this 2020 field trial have indicated that tank mixing generally improves Cercospora leaf spot disease control uh, with DMIs. However, depending on the combination, interactions are occurring between certain chemistries and formulations that results in variable efficacy. In addition, phosphite and sulfur seem to be candidate tank mix partners that uh, can provide equivalent or improved control. However, a subsequent field trial is needed to validate these interactions that have been identified. And lastly, you may be asking, so how does tank mixing actually interfere with the development of resistance? So I've, actually, I've also been isolating hundreds of Cercospora cultures from this trial, and I'll be working with Dr. Melvin Bolton to gain a better understanding. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank the Sugar Beet R&E Board for funding, the guys at our North Farm, particularly Jeff Nielsen and the rest of our summer crew, and of course, the many companies for chemical product and seed. And lastly, a big shout out for Dr. Ashok Chanda for his guidance and support. And with that, I'll take any questions. So let's move on to our uh, next speaker for the morning session here, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Khan. He will be talking about managing Cercospora leaf spot using fungicides and host resistance. Thank you. Ready, Ashok? Yeah, yes, you can go All ahead. Right. I will continue what we are Lean left off. I will discuss about uh, managing Cercospora leaf spot and I will summarize the highlights of what we've been doing the past uh, five years. So, this is a picture of Southern Minnesota and the Mindak area. This is what happened in 2016, and it's still a problem today. Uh, we saw way back in 2016 that uh, the checks by the end of August, the leaves are gone. And a few weeks later, uh, the oldest leaves are killed. That helps in reduction in our tonnage, as well as reduction in sugar concentration. As Lou spoke earlier, the pyroclostrobin and the trifloxystrobin, uh, as well as our uh, DMIs, they were very, very effective from around 2000 to 2015. But starting in 2016, we had full-scale resistance. The QIs were not working early in the season, as well as later in the season, you can kind of see effect on the uh, reduction in growth. Our other savior, we were hoping will be biological control, but by themselves, Bacillus mycoides or Bacillus amyloliquefaciens were not different from the Czech. Neither was Bacillus subtilis or the plant product, Renotria sachalirensis. Uh, they were also not significantly different from the Czech. The triazoles, which were very effective until about 2015, suddenly also became less efficacious because of reduced sensitivity. It didn't matter if it was tetraconazole, the mixture diphenconazole and propiconazole, or the older flow triafol. Uh, th these numbers will kind of show you here that as you get high disease severity, the recall of sucrose goes down. These products used to be very effective at one time, will probably give you least spot rating of less than six, which is more or less the economic threshold. What we saw also was that depending on the year, the amount of rainfall, the frequency of rainfall, that affected also the efficacy of the DMIs. Here in, in 2017, you can see tetraconazole, Inspire XT, and Proline. Uh, in terms of efficacy, Proline was the most efficacious, but they are again, not as effective as they were prior to 2016. In 2019, where the disease pressure was much lower, at least earlier in the season, all the triazoles look fairly well. And if you compare the leaf spot rating as well as the recoupable sucrose per acre, you can see in 2019, the triazoles work much better. Less than six was the leaf spot rating. Whereas in 2017, the leaf spot rating was much higher, eight to 9.5. And with the higher leaf spot rating, high disease severity, the recoupable sucrose was also lower compared to 2019. So a lot depends on the uh, environmental conditions also as to how these fungicides will act. Dr. Secor spoke earlier about tin. Tin has been our savior. 
It is one of the most effective fungicides since 2016 when used individually. The other fungicides which works well some of the years, but not every year is ProLine. However, if you add ProLine with tin, as in the top pictures, you get better disease control early in the season. And the top picture was taken at uh, the field plot day and the lower picture was taken two weeks afterwards. You can see with the addition of tin, the ProLine was much more effective. We also saw that Inspire by itself was not as effective as when you added triphenyl tin hydroxide. And the same story could be said for Minerva by itself was not as effective as when you add tin to it. So this table here tells us that ProLine, Inspire, and Minerva in this particular year here was performing fairly well, lower than six, 4.3 and 5.8. Tin was doing well by itself at 4.3. And when you added tin to the triazoles, you had lower disease severity and higher numerically number for recoverable sucrose per acre. What about the multi-site fungicides? Uh, prior to uh, 2016, we were not using mancozeb, ditane, or copper in our fungicide program. However, because of resistance, widespread resistance in 2016, we started using the mancozeb and the copper. And you can see in this table here, the mancozeb and the badge by themselves give you a leaf spot rating of less than six, which is telling us that there is no significant economic damage and you have fairly high recoverable sucrose per acre. If you were to mix these two different modes of action, multi-site, a copper with an EBDC, you also get good control and high recoverable sucrose per acre. At least we're seeing that visually. And at the same time, they're helping to manage resistance. This picture tells a story again here with an EBDC and a site specific. This is what we recommend to growers, but we don't recommend using the same thing over and over again. For those of you, us who are not aware of Southern Minnesota, those growers have to apply fungicides six or seven times per season, and they have to apply mixtures. So we only have so many fungicides that we can kind of use in these mixtures. So triazole is one of the base and tin. So we typically will use those uh, with an EBDC or a copper. So here you have an EBDC as well as a triazole. You can use a copper and a triazole, and you have excellently spot control compared to even the guest rows. You can also use, if you're in an area where your pressure is not so high, two EBDCs, which will be a copper and an EBDC, and you'll have good control. If you're in the northern part of the valley where the pressure is not very high, although topsin by itself is not very effective because we don't recommend using that throughout the season, but if you use it once in the season in your first application with tin, tin is already working well, you have excellent disease control. If you want to manage resistance, you can do a three-way split, whereby you have a triazole, you have a tin, and you have a copper. So you can use that combination or an EBDC, so you have better disease control and you're getting rid of your sensitive, your resistant isolates. What else were, uh, did we find? We have tested a number of other products, experimental products. Nothing has really been effective. Chlorotanil, which is labeled on probably more crops than any other fungicide, but not labeled for sugar beet in the US, by itself provides fair control, but when used with products that are not very effective by themselves, such as Priaxor, which is a QOI, and ProLine provided fairly effective disease control and high recoverable sucrose per acre. Now, we do the individual treatments more or less just to see how they will perform by themselves or in mixtures. Again, just using the same uh, product four or five times per season. That is more or less for the scientists. We also do rotational programs, and these are the programs that we recommend to growers. And you can see if you mix fungicides, different modes of action, you have high recoverable sucrose and you make money in terms of recoverable dollars per acre. These pictures shows you that if you use fungicides in rotation, different modes of action, you have effective disease control when your fungicides are not impacted by frequent rainfall. 
So 2018 and 2019, you had excellent disease control. 2016 and 2020, you had poor disease control. And I will show you a few slides where even if you had six or seven fungicide application, your, your disease control was still ineffective. For those of us who will just like to use the multi-site fungicides and keep the site-specific fungicides away for some time with the hope of trying to keep that population down, these pictures show us that the multi-site fungicides in mixture, three, four, or five applications, depending on where you are, will control the disease. Please note that our label says we can only use 10, three applications per season at a full rate. So most growers will use at least three applications of tin to max it out because it's our best fungicide. These pictures here show our research site at Foxholm on August 25th and then September 2nd. If you look carefully on the left-hand side here, you can see some really green plots and some that are not so brown. A few, one week afterward, if you go there because of a favorable environmental condition, you can see even less uh, green plots, but some of them are very, very standout. And those are varieties that are resistant. In the research plots, any green that you're seeing here is more or less not because of fungicides, but because of fungicide of the host resistance of the particular varieties. This final picture that I will show here, wherever you see brown, doesn't mean that fungicides are not applied. In most of these areas, in this particular slide here, fungicides were applied. The places where they are, are effective is a combination of the varietal resistance, ratings of two or three, more or less. And where you have the brown areas is you have varieties of five or 4.5 and higher. Five and six applications were not controlling this disease in 2020. So what's my take home message? We need to have improved CLS resistant varieties. And I'm thankful to the seed companies for providing a number of these varieties that will be available, probably at a limited amount for some of the growers, especially in the Mindak area, and hopefully, hopefully in more growing areas next season. Our population is still highly resistant to the QOIs and the, you have reduced sensitivity to the DMIs. If we use mixtures starting at an early timing and continue in a timely manner, if rainfall does not impact our fungicides, we will have effective disease control. Timeliness of fungicide is critical and the first fungicide application is very critical. With that, I will say thank you, especially to the r &E board for funding my research, seed and chemical industries who have helped out, Bruce Sundin from Accoms who helped with some pictures, and Luke Skanskard from KWS who took a lot of the uh, site pictures. Kevin for allowing me to work on his farm and all my colleagues for doing the hard work and making this research available to you. If you have any questions, you can address those in the question box or send an email to mohammed.khan at ndsu.edu. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan for your excellent presentation. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions here. So I do have a question, Muhammad. Did you have any treatments in 2020 only using uh, the multi-site fungicides? Yes, I had fungicides with the multi-site fungicides. And uh, depending on the variety, if you had a variety that was resistant, it will look good. But for the most part, if you were using a susceptible variety, even the tin, which works well by itself, by the beginning of September, everything was going down. And even in some trials where we had adjuvants mixed with the uh, multi-site, even those adjuvants could not help because of the uh, frequency of the rainfall that we had. So it is very, very imperative that we do get improved resistant varieties because we don't know what kind of a weather we'll get during the growing season. Thank you. But if you have any more questions, please follow with Dr. Khan with Q&A or chat options. And now I would just want to give the floor to uh, Mr. Eric Edmund, the chair for the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board of Minnesota and North Dakota.
Again, we thank you uh, for funding this valuable research, Eric and all the board members. Um, yeah, please go ahead. All right, thank you, Dr. Chanda. Uh, on behalf of the Research and Education Board, it is my pleasure to present three awards today, starting with the Dr. Dexter uh, Scholarship Award. Hopefully that popped up on the screen to share. Yes, that's good. That's good. good. Okay, great. Our award winner for the Dr. Dexter Scholarship Award is Mr. Jake Botkin. Jake, a native of, a native of Corcoran, Minnesota, obtained his BS from the University of Minnesota and is pursuing an MS degree in plant pathology at the University of Minnesota as well. His advisors are Drs. Chan Ashok Chanda and Corey Hirsch. Jake's research is focused on developing a DNA-based detection method for sugar beta-phenomyces in soil and plant tissues. Jake hopes that his research will be useful in estimating the risk of a phenomyces in growers' fields and understanding the biology of this important pathogen at the molecular level. Jake is known for his calmness, highest work ethic, and passion for research in plant sciences. Jake, congratulations on the award. Moving on to our Distinguished Service Award. Just gotta get my screen organized here. Yeah, stop sharing for us, yeah. Yep. Our Distinguished Service Award winner is Dr. Tom Peters. Dr. Peters is the Extension Sugar Beet Agronomist and Weed Control Specialist at North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota, supporting farmers growing sugar beets in Minnesota, North Dakota, and Eastern Montana. His interests are integrated weed management, including nurse and cover crops and inner row cultivation, complementing pre and post herbicides and sugar beet and weed control in crops and sequence of sugar beet. Peters consistently asks growers and agriculturists about their weed control challenges and has worked diligently to provide solutions that meet their needs. He does an excellent job of tailoring his research to the needs of different geographies. An example where his research made a real difference is in controlling glyphosate resistant water hemp while maintaining the use of cover crops. His work regarding the control of kochia and common ragweed are also important, but for a different geography, demonstrating his understanding of different needs in different geographies. Dr. Peterson, Dr. Peters' influence expands beyond Minnesota, North Dakota, sugar beet growing regions. Tom has established himself as one of the go-to weed scientists in the sugar beet industry. Consequently, let's see, sorry about that. Consequently, his advice and opinion are requested by people from across the country. Dr. Peters joined NDSU and the University of Minnesota in 2014 following a 25 year career at Monsanto. Tom is a Minnesota native receiving his BS degree in agronomy and soil science at the University of Minnesota, his MS degree from the University of Nebraska and his PhD from North Dakota State University. Tom's advisor at NDSU was Dr. Alan Dexter, longtime extension sugar beet specialist and friend to this community. committee. Tom has numerous ho hobbies, including college football, Tom and his family are longtime gopher season ticket holder, holders, growing hosta and listening to folk music on vinyl. Tom, congratulations on the Distinguished Service Award. And our final award is our Meritus Service Award. Hmm. Let's see. And for that, the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board would like to recognize Dr. Albert Sims for his dedication and contributions to, our, to the sugar beet industry. Dr. Sims is a soil and fertility special, specialist and was instrumental in getting our growers to adopt the practice of using starter fertilizer to get the, crop, the sugar beet crops off to a fast and healthy start. Dr. Sims was awarded the Distinguished Service Award in 2004 for his many contributions to the industry. As director of the University of Minnesota Crookston Research and Outreach Center, 
He has also served on the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board and the International Sugar Beet Institute. We thank him for his decades of service as a researcher, educator, and for providing leadership. With that being said, we award the Meritorious Service Award to Dr. Albert Sims. Congratulations, Mr. Do or congratulations, Dr. Sims. On behalf of the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board and our industry, I would like to thank these gentlemen for their past, current, and future contributions to our industry. Thank you very much. Eric, do you mind if I say a couple of words? And I promise I'll be brief. Absolutely. So I, I need to thank everybody. Um, it's really been a privilege and an honor to work in the sugar beet industry. And I'll be honest with you, I had no idea about how complicated weed management would be. So um, we've tried a lot of ideas and we're going to continue to try different things. And I really appreciate the trust of the board and also the growers that are um, considering our different ideas for controlling weeds. And lastly, Eric, I, I, I need to thank the, uh, uh, the gentleman that nominated me for the award, um, Mr. Todd Jocelius, Mr. Mark Bloomquist from Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar. Thanks, guys.